So, what is digital image correlation? Digital So in general, this is a very powerful technique that's being used kind of all over industry right now because of its its generality and um, kind of the, the algorithms that are developing now to process these <coughs> images. Uh, but basically, in at, in its simplest form, you're tracking a random a random speckle pattern on a sample around in space to measure displacements, which then you use to calculate strain. So track random speckles around to calculate some displacement field u, which then you use to calculate some strain field. So what does that mean? What does that look like? What do I mean when I say a random speckle pattern? So it's a good question. I'll, I'll show you it in a little bit. First, I want to show some actual examples of digital image correlation. If if it switches to my laptop, which of course this thing never works when I want it to. Um, switch. Come on, you can do it. I believe in you. I don't believe in myself though. Uh, I have very little faith. I know. I'm rapidly rapidly losing faith in myself because I'm forgetting to plug things in. Uh, that would probably help. Is this gonna... God damn it. <laughs> it just came up in this. It did, but it always does the... It always does the extend, and I wanted to do the duplicate. Come on. There we go. All right, so digital image correlation. I'll post these slides to Canvas, um, but in general, you're creating some sort of a random speckle pattern on a material. So you may have seen some, some type of image like this before, uh, but the idea is you're creating a random black and white dot speckle. Uh, there's a few qualities that it needs to have. Yeah. Is that supposed to be the plate with a hole in the center? Yeah, this is a plate with a hole in the center. This is an actual sample, I think. The, the gradient is there, for, like something in the background is fuzzy. Um, but, so, this is a very general technique. It can be applied at very small length scales. So, that's a speckle pattern at the micro scale, so 40 micron scale bar. Uh, remember, a piece of paper is about 100 microns thick. So, the speckle is, is very, very tiny there, using some sort of uh, nano nano speckle dots and you can still use that to, to track the points around in space um, or you can apply it to big stuff so this is a turbine blade that you're then basically you paint on dots with a with a very coarse paintbrush so mathematically you're you're taking some speckle pattern trying to correlate the image as it as it deforms back and forth uh, but that doesn't necessarily change depending on how big the sample is. So you can use it at, at big scales, you can use it at small scales, you can do it for dynamic testing, you can do it for quasi-static testing, so long as you have a camera with the right resolution to capture this sort of an image uh, and to capture it at the speed that you want. So I'm going to show a couple videos that, ex that show kind of what's going on. If it wants to... <coughs> come on. There we go. Jeez. Um, so this is a uniaxial tension bar with a DIC speckle pattern on it being deformed. What, what we're plotting now is the strain. Oh, what is, what is going on? There we go. So before this thing, uh, it broke. Damn. So it's on a loop, so it'll keep going. But it's plotting the strain, path basically. So now before failure happens, you can start to see failure localizing there. And so that's, remember in, in the first lab, I had asked why can't you, uh, why can't you take the engineering strain? Why, why can't you assume it's uniform? Because here before failure happens, you have a whole bunch of strain localizing. And DIC is actually a technique where you can see where that localization happens and the amount that, of strain that localizes there prior to failure. Um, 
uni ICL tension is kind of a, a simple one. You can also use it for doing crack fields, uh, which is a more interesting one. So this is what we'll be talking about, I think tomorrow and into next week, but the stress concentration around a hole, a plate with a crack in it. So you can see these kind of crazy, almost butterfly -y stress concentrations that are coming up around the tip. Um, and eventually that thing will break. Eventually. Maybe. <laughs> there it goes. So DIC in general is a very powerful technique for, for imaging strain fields in materials. Uh, there's a lot of problems with it and a lot of drawbacks with it that you kind of have to be aware of <laughs> when using the technique. So that's today I'll talk about generally how it works and then what some of those drawbacks are. Um, and all the things to, to keep in mind when doing it. Um, I also have this. Oh. Let's see if it goes. Come on. There we go. So uh, this was a, a DIC test out of work that I did um, recently. I did this image a couple of years, or uh, yeah, about a year and a half ago. So this is a 3D carbon fiber composite, 3D woven carbon fiber composite. And you can see kind of all these crazy localized stress concentrations in this material. Um, you see prior to failure, or there it goes, before it breaks, um, you saw, uh, if I can use my mouse, um, you saw some regions of the sample here. You start to lose the DIC pattern. You start to lose that strain gradient. And I'll talk a little bit later about why that happens. Um, but in general, you can get very high spatial resolution uh, deformation mappings on, on a part that's being deformed kind of in a, in a very, to large strains in, in a complicated way. Um, and this, this type of uh, measurement, you, you wouldn't be able to do with, with a normal sort of strain gauge approach that we'd use for, for example, the beam bending lab. So, um, what are some of the advantages and disadvantages to DIC? So, advantages, the pros, um, it's large area strain mapping, area strain map. So you can get a strain map over the entire specimen now, instead of just a strain gauge gives you the strain at, at one point, and even then it's a rosette, and then you have to do strain transformations to figure out what the strain is. Here, <laughs> you're tracking particles arbitrarily on the surface, so you can get the whole surface area um, kind of all simultaneously without uh, any, any strain gauges or anything. Uh, it's non-contact. So when we're applying these sorts of, of strain maps, there's, there's a few different ways you can do it. The, the simplest being you just spray paint your sample and get some sort of a random speckle. You could even, if the, if the sample was big enough, you could kind of paint dots or you could use a printer with transfer paper. Uh, you could get a roll with some random speckle and roll dots onto your, onto your sample. There's a whole bunch of ways to kind of get that pattern there so long as you can get some sort of a random pattern. But once it's on there, all you have to do is image it. You don't have to actually touch the sample to measure anything. Um, so. You get large area strain maps, full field strain resolution. Uh, resolution. So you can get all the strain components, the E, X, E, Y, E, Z, which um, in, the, in the lab you'll see later kind of how each of those pop out. Um, e, Z, E, X, E, Y, E, X, Y, because it's only a 2D. So the axial and the shear components of strain on your surface. Um, it's independent of specimen size and loading rate. Independent of size and rate. So again, you can do something on the micro scale and you can do something on the macro scale. You could image a whole uh, wind turbine blade if you wanted to, or you could image kind of a, a a micro pillar, uh, so long as you have some method for getting a speckle pattern on there, which is generally easier when the thing is bigger, but that's a separate issue. Um, and, and 
in terms of rate. It doesn't matter if it's if it's fast strain rate. It doesn't matter if it's slow strain rate. Um, so long as you have a camera that's fast enough to capture images, uh, and basically this is like like thousands thousands of strain gauges. So it's instead of physically applying a whole bunch of strain gauges to a sample, now at every point you can figure out what the strain is, again, without actually doing this. Um, cons. So I'll go into detail in a, little, in a little bit about exactly how these cons pop up, but um, it's very prone to noise. Noise and error, which I can write error. Error. Um, so this is, again, part of what you'll be seeing in the lab is because it's an image-based technique and because there's noise around a pixel, an individual pixel, because camera resolutions aren't perfect, there can be a lot of noise in the system, and that noise then leads to error in your displacement and your strain measurement. Um, they can be kind of difficult to, uh, difficult to get a good quality speckle pattern. Difficult to get good speckle. So I'll talk again a little bit about what a, what quantif what makes a good speckle pattern and what makes it and why you actually need it to be random uh, and why why it can't just be like a nice grid of points. Um, it's sensitive to sensitive to parameter uh, selection. Parameters. So I'll talk a little bit about what those parameters are, about exactly how these things are calibrated and how they're calculated. Um, and you need, need a good camera. Camera and powerful software to do this analysis. So it has basically the potential to be to, to, to be a very powerful technique, but there are a lot of considerations that you have to make when doing measurements uh, and when going through the process of, of analyzing DIC results. So let's talk about what image correlation actually is. So when I say digital image correlation, <coughs> what is image correlation? So basically, on a part, I have some sample with some region that I'm interested in. So say this thing looks initially like, like that. What the software is going to do is find find a very specific pattern find and, and kind of give that some unique identifier. So initially it's going to say, all right, I'm going to look here at this surface and I'm going to find this one spot with this these five points in this particular arrangement. Between images, it's then going to track the displacement of that and the, the change in shape of that. So if, if these five points then rotate and stretch out and, and bend and whatever, then image correlation tracks the motion from, from one position to the next position at a time Tn to a time Tn plus one. And so it tries to find very distinct patterns. So this is why, um, this is why you need it to be somewhat random. So it tracks uh, a subset of <laughs> points from one position to another. Yep. But in order to do that, it needs to be random. So there's a few qualities of a good pattern. Qualities. Yeah. It's if everything is identical, then it can't track unique patterns. Yeah. So if you had, say, like a, a grid of black dots or something, it would be difficult for it to track because if one ends up <coughs> in the place where another one was, then it could think it was 
like a head move at all or something like that. Yeah. So if I had a perfectly regular grid of dots, yeah, it, it tries to see that initial grid, yeah. but then if that thing moves too fast, you end up with the same thing back at the same spot, so it could maybe not know that it moved at all. So you need to find unique subsets of points in this map. So if you have bigger and smaller and kind of oddly shaped blotches, then it's easier for it to track. Yep, it actually does help. Okay. Um, there's getting a good DIC pattern is a little bit of an art and a science. There's papers on optimal DIC patterns um, and how, how they should look. I think in, um, in one of the YouTube videos that I showed, uh, I'm gonna run the risk of screwing this up. Oh, it worked, cool. So here you see there's a grid of points here and another grid of points here. And they took those two and superimposed them to now get this sort of quasi-random pattern. It's not perfectly random, but it's random enough that you can still get a, a reasonable DIC pattern out of it. Um, ideally, you would take that on top of it, add slightly varying point sizes, uh, and add slightly varying gray shapes on top. So something like this is, I, I think I recognize something like this out of, out of ways that people have tried to make optimal random patterns, but there's, it, it's it's a computer imaging thing. I don't really do research into it, yeah. so I don't know exactly what makes this pattern optimal or not. <laughs> um, but yeah, so there's there's a reason they're not just looking at that subset, it's that they're superimposing them on top of each other. People have written papers on that. There are, yeah. They're mainly, they're either math papers or computer vision papers, um, so they're all dense. <laughs> um, and I don't know, you can try reading some if you're interested, but yeah. Okay, so qualities of a good DIC pattern. Um, it needs to be non-repetitive, so quasi-random. Non-repetitive. Uh, it needs to be isotropic. So that means it needs to be equally random in all directions, uh, and it needs to have a high contrast. Because you're tracking points, you want it to be high black, high white. So you need to, ha need to have a high contrast between the points, otherwise it's hard to recognize what is where. So an example of some of them, if I have a perfectly regular grid of points, this is uh, this is repetitive. Repetitive. So again, if it if it tries to track a subset initially here, this may look exactly the same as a subset that's over here, and it may not be able to track exactly which one is which. It needs to be isotropic. So what that means is, if I have something that's still sort of random in some direction, um, or sort sort of random, but uh, here now, if I, if I try to track a spot here, that's not necessarily any different than the spot down here. So even though it's, it's different spatially in one direction, it may not be different spatially in the other, or random enough in the other direction. So this is uh, anisotropic. And it needs to be high contrast. So, grab. if I drew this with pencil, say, this will hopefully show up even better on the board. But if I then started to make a speckle pattern with a whole bunch of dots on there, can you see those dots at all? Mm -hmm. Sort of. But so now if you were trying to analyze the displacement of those dots with a computer or a program, it's, it's not going to work very well. So that's be high contrast, something like this, instead of something like this. So you can actually distinguish where individual splotches and pixels are. Um, there. Is there any advantage to doing different colors? Uh, no, not really. Normally just black and white. Um, yeah. <laughs> Camouflage pattern would potentially work, but it need it need to be uh, so 
you need to have small small feature sizes relative to the camera, uh, relative to the pixel, uh, which I'll talk about in a minute, um, and that it would need to be again high contrast. So you could do like black and white camouflage, but it doesn't really camouflage at that point. You're like a zebra, unless you're trying to camouflage with zebras. Um, but yeah, something like that is is potentially a good pattern. It sort of depends. So a good pattern um, is something with random dots, even potentially in random shapes, randomly on a on a specimen, with then varying size, kind of layered on top. Uh, of that. So then it's something that is that is high contrast that there's very uniquely distinguishable regions of the sample, re distinguishable subsets of the sample. Um, so this is low contrast. This is good. Probably not the best, but uh, there's a few other things that you have to think about in terms of the image size, which I think I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, so one other thing to think about. So in turn, this is kind of general qualities of a good pattern for image correlation. You also need to think about um, how much or how fast your pattern is moving. So it's trying to track again a point, some, some subset from point A to point B. So if your subset moves, so the subset has to move slowly and deform <coughs> slowly. Otherwise, it can get lost. So you remember in the in the video that I showed, the one that I in the 3D composite, there was regions that just kind of disappeared, um, or gradient regions that disappeared. That's because the 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 speckle pattern basically sheared and deformed too much. So if, if there's a crack that propagates through, for example, then the speckles that were there are now too far apart for it to recognize that it's the same pattern. Um, you can play with the computer algorithm to, to recognize how much certain patterns have moved, but then if you make it too, if you make it too easy to recognize when points have moved far apart, then you may get other noise issues. So it's kind of a balancing issue. Um, but in general, your pattern has to deform a little bit <coughs> step to step and move a little bit step to step in order to track the points. So you can still do it at high strain rates as long as you have a very high capture rate camera. Um, okay, so the what is it doing when it's actually calculating or measuring these displacements? So it's doing some displacement displacement correlation. So it's taking some subset of points here. Oh, I drew too many points there. Um, and tracking it with some deformation to a new state. Da, 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 da. three, four, sure, something like that. I think that's the same number of points. Um, so that deformation, because this is a 2D image, has some u and some v. So this is the displacement, basically the displacement of each point in the x direction and the displacement of each point in the y direction. Um, so then what it's doing between images is it's trying to come up, it's trying to correlate those two images. So there's some correlation function, function that it's using. Some C, uh, which is a function now of the displacement, the gradient of the displacements, du, dy, and the gradient of the displacement, uh, the displacements and the gradient of the displacements in the other direction. dv, dx, dv, dy. So depending on exactly what algorithm you're using, they're all sort of doing the same basic underlying thing. They say, all right, I start with some subset here. This moves to a new shape. That new shape has some 
displacement, some general displacement from point one to point two, some general, uh, some general deformation. So that subset then stretches out in one direction, stretches uh, shears in one direction, and it tries to figure out what those stretches and what those shears are, and it applies some weight to each of these with some function, some algorithm function, and then when you get hundreds of these subsets or thousands of these subsets all across, it kind of optimizes and interpolates across them. So you have some algorithm for maximizing rhythm for maximizing correlation between subsets um, and then in the end what it's going to spit out what it's looking for is these uh, deformation fields so and result is it spits out some u, some v, du, dx, du, u, dy, dv, dx, dv, dy. So it spits out for each of these subsets the u uh, and the u and the v and the, the gradients of u and v. And so this is depending on exactly what DIC software you're using uh, and exactly what algorithms they implement, you, you can basically get the same initial pictures because you're, you're starting with video data and you're plugging it into the software. You can start off with that exact same video data and get drastically different results depending on how they're implementing this correlation. Um, so what that actually looks like, so implementation, inter interpolation. In, in terms of a full field strain map now. So, relation is, I'm going to start off with a big something with a whole bunch of dots on it. Um, and basically it's going to look, it's going to create a subset here, and then it's going to create another subset some distance on top of it. And it's going to have multiples of these subsets then layered kind of all over the sample in all sorts of different directions. Oh. There's a couple uh, figures of merit now when it's doing oh, when it's doing this interpolation. Um, so so it tracks now. It does this this step where it tracks a subset to a deformed state. Now it's tracking potentially hundreds or thousands of subsets all across. And between this, it knows there has to be some continuity. So then you can do, it, they normally apply some sort of smoothing functions to, to interpolate between different points so that you get a, then a smooth displacement field. And not only do you have to optimize for the, for the displacement field of one subset, you optimize for the displacement field of the whole set, the whole set of subsets. Um, yeah. And so, Practically, there's a couple things you need to know when you're doing this correlation, uh, when you're doing it in the software side. So <coughs> there's two main parameters you can play with, your L and then from the centers of these points, the D. Um, so the L here is the subset size, 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 uh, and D is the spacing subset. So if you have basically in a given picture, in a given image, there's a limited amount of data. If you have a megapixel, gigapixel camera, whatever, you have some n number of pixels. If you have a bigger subset, there's going to be more points inside of that to track. So you're going to be able to better figure out exactly what the displacement is, but you're also losing resolution because now there's a limited, again, a limited amount of space. So if my, if my subset is large relative to my total picture size, it's, I'm not going to get as much information out of it as if my image was small. So this is where kind of the, the art of DIC comes in. What, what you're looking for generally in each subset um, is you want to have ideally 
um, like three to six speckles per subset in order to track it properly. If you have two, you can't figure out what the shears are. If you have three, then you can actually figure out a deformation map. Uh, and then if you have more, you get a better quality uh, subset that you can see. So you can, you can track the displacement of those points better. Um, and each pixel, uh, so, so there's a limited number of, of pixels, pixel resolution for each camera. Ideally, you want each speckle <coughs> to be around speckle size to be around three pixels, three to five pixels across. Three to five pixels. So if a speckle size is only one pixel, then it's going to kind of get lost in the noise. But if, if, the, if the speckle diameter is about three pixels, then there'll be some contrast and it'll actually be able to pick up the point and it won't just get lost in the noise of the pixel. So then this changes if you're looking at a very big part, again, remember you have a limited number of pixels in your camera. If you're looking at a very big part, your pixels then need to be relatively large relative to the size of the, of the pixels of your camera. If you're looking at something super, super tiny, then the spots need to be super tiny again because you're aiming now for the roughly the same pixel size of the spot relative to your camera size. Um, so there's a couple, I think, so now bigger, bigger subsets, bigger subsets and uh, bigger pixels go to loss resolution. Because now, say, imagine, imagine your image was, was maybe this big um, and your pixels now are, or your speckles are this big in your image you're not going to be able to pull a whole lot of information out of there because the speckles are large relative to your total image size. So the smaller the pixels are, the better quality you can get, but they still need to be bigger than... Uh, the smaller the speckles are, the better resolution you can get. The individual speckles still have to be big enough to actually image with your camera. Um, so what this all ends up doing is then you're calculating a strain map. So. Uh, I don't really need it. Uh, one more note. Um, so, in the end, let's draw this. End result, you're trying to strain. So, if you remember from, I think, maybe the second or third week when we were talking about strains, now we can define our strains in different directions to be that gradient, du dx, epsilon y is dv dy and as on xy is one half du dy plus dv dx. So this is again our, our general definition of strain which only comes from displacement. So we're taking that displacement field in the software once we figure out what these values of du, dv and their gradients are we can plug that in to find strain. So this is sort of the general process for how DIC is, works and some of the, the considerations you have to make. So um, on top of that, there's, so, so the knob, the, the main knob that you can tune experimentally, you need to make a good, a good speckle pattern, which there's not exactly a precise way of doing it, but generally it has to be something that's non-repetitive, isotropic, and high contrast. Um, and then the pixel sizes in it should, or the speckle size should be small relative to the pixel size, so around three to five pixels. Um, and then you, in terms of the software, the one big knob you can turn is eyes of this subset. Um, and so you can then change how many speckles there are per subset to get more or less information out and get better or worse correlation between things. And so in the lab, you'll see generally how that works. So uh, Anmol should kind of go through and, and change, change image sizes and uh, change subset sizes and, and show you how that affects the noise differently. So questions on that? If not, I'm going to jump into the lab for this week. <coughs>
Okay, cool. So, the lab for this week. Oh, this is gonna. How am I gonna. Oh, come on. Screw it. You were staying there. Okay. I don't know why they made this cable like the exact length that it needs to be to just plug in over there. And so I can't move my computer at all. And I don't want to yank it out because I don't want to screw up all the other electronics that are in there. Um, so yeah. That screen's on a swivel, you can move the attached screen to the top your left. Yeah, so the, this, the screen can move. Yeah, I can. Then I'm kind of hiding in the corner a little bit. But, uh, let's uh, try not to ruin everything. There we go. All right. Cool. This is a little bit better. Cool. All right. So. The lab for this week now is DIC. So uh, we're going to be looking at um, the tension of a hole, or the tension of a plate with a hole in it. Or technically, be, technically you'll be looking at two specimens. They'll both be EPDM, EPDMS, EPDM, EPDM rubber. So kind of a general rubber specimen uh, that we got from one of the grad students in the department. You'll be looking at their I think 25 millimeters by something 150. Uh, Bill has already prepared them all, has applied a speckle pattern to them, so you don't have to worry about that part. Um, I guess you can kind of talk about the quality of the pattern after the fact. Trying to make your own good or bad quality pattern. Um, you'll be looking at one specimen without a hole, and then one specimen with a small, uh, I think, four millimeter hole, four point something. Um, there's the theory that we had talked about yesterday for the stress concentration around a hole or plate with a hole in it. Um, and again, you have that three sigma infinity and minus sigma infinity stress concentration here at the top and right and left <laughs> side. Um, so what you'll be getting out of your, of this DIC result, of the DIC thing. So EPDMS rubber, EPDM rubber, um, specimen size, one with a hole. Um, there's a DIC camera in the lab. I don't know if you noticed, but there was kind of a box that was normally shoved up high uh, on the Instron system. That box is actually a camera that's used for DIC. So there's that DIC camera. You'll have some rubber specimen with some clamped grips in there uh, to do the tests. Uh, you'll take that sample, pull on it, and it'll spit out a strain map. So what you then need to do is we're giving you a couple things. So here's an example of good and bad speckle patterns. Um, there's a couple things that you'll need to, to do. So <coughs> basically you'll have, so the, a specimen with and without a hole, you'll be looking at then, um, remember it's spitting out strain, you'll be looking at the strain maps. So you need to, you need to plot the general load displacement curve for the samples and figure out the applied strain and applied stresses. Um, use those applied strains and stresses to figure out what the theoretical, or use those applied stresses to figure out what the theoretical strains would be uh, in, the, in the sample without a hole and in the sample with a hole. In the lab, we're giving you, uh, so we gave you some MATLAB code, which, let's see, if I can connect to the remote desktop, if that works. Um, so we gave you some MATLAB code to do the, the contour plot of the strain. So the one that I had shown yesterday in class, um, let's get that going, wherever that wants to go. Um, so basically you'll have in a, in a hole without a, in a sheet without a hole, there should be no stress concentration through it. You should be theoretically getting a uniform strain through the whole thing. That's not actually the case because of the noise associated with the IC. So you'll be looking at then that un, unholed specimen, the specimen without a hole, to figure out what the noise floor is. So you say, all right, if I'm applying 10 MPA of stress, I should get 
some strain in the transverse direction because of Poisson's ratio and some strain axially because that's the direction I'm stretching it in. Um, take what those values are theoretically and you'll have some error above and below that just from the DIC measurement itself. That's kind of your noise floor, the error floor. Then around the whole of the plate, you should see some stress concentrations. So ideally those would be three and minus one. It's realistically, that may not be what they are. So you'll have to go and think about that may not be the case. Use the error, the noise floor from the hole without a, the specimen without a hole uh, to, as a comparison. And then think about kind of what, where our theory is, why that theory may, be, may, may break down, um, and explain that all in the lab. Uh, there's, we gave you, uh, so on the specimen, uh, we're giving you, uh, basically, you can define something called a virtual strain gauge in the software. So on top of the speckle pattern, you can, the speckle pattern gives you a total gradient map, deformation map. But what we'll do on top of that is, is apply some, some virtual strain gauges, or on will apply some virtual strain gauges where it'll actually spit out data that you can use. So it would be as if you had, <coughs> as if you actually had a strain gauge here experimentally, it'll spit out that E, X, E, Y, E, Z, um, or it'll be like if you had a strain rosette, I guess, so if you don't have to worry about strain transformations, it'll spit out X, E, Y, E, Z. Um, for each of those points, you need to figure out theoretically what the strains would be at that point, given the stress distribution, uh, or given the stress in the sample, uh, and then compare that to a theoretical measurement. So there's two, we'll have you do this at two different strains. Basically, the DIC process, you'll be getting a, a video of the displacement, and you'll have a video of, of the strain evolution at each of those points. We want you to take two snapshots out of that, one snapshot at a low strain, so one snapshot at around five, less than 5% applied strain, uh, and one snapshot at a large applied strain. I think total we're going up to 30%-ish, but you can kind of take it anywhere in there. Um, and compare then from our small strain linear elastic hole in a plate calculations what the difference is between those, uh, between, between your experimental measurements and your theoretical plot. Um, we're giving you on the site, uh, on Canvas, we gave you some code for a hole in a plate, which this now should work. Let's change the folder. So all of you are familiar with MATLAB. You've all used it at some point in the past. Hopefully, is there anybody who hasn't? Who's never worked with MATLAB at all? Okay, cool. Um, so the code should hopefully be pretty plug and play. There's a few parameters here at the beginning that you can mess with. Um, your region of interest width and height, your hole radius. These are non-dimensional because it doesn't really matter what their total size is. It's just relative ratios for, for plotting uh, for comparing to your, your experimental sample. But what this will then spit out is these strain maps. Oh, why? Here we go. So this is now for the, the theoretical strain distribution for a plate with a hole in it and an, an infinite applied strain in the transverse direction, in the x direction, which as a note, is 90 degrees rotated from what you'll be doing experimentally. Just remember that when you're plotting these images, because in experimentally we're pulling it up in this, we're assuming the strain, the stress is being applied in the x direction. Uh, so here you can see the numbers are a little bit weird. It depends on exactly what your applied stress is, but um, you're here, the high, high concentration at the, at the root of that hole is something on the order of 16. The concentration here on the side is something like, oh, if we zoom in, it should be something like minus five or minus four, which you can do. These are contour plots in MATLAB. There we go. Minus five, minus six. Uh, and the high point here is, is around 15, 16. So there's still that factor of three difference theoretically in the strain, but <coughs> it's maybe a little bit less than just the stress plot. Um, so you can use then 
Um, here in your theoretical relations, we want you to actually plug in uh, some value, some, some basically plug in the positions into those stress calculate stress formulations. Use 3D Hooke's law to transform that into strain, similar to what you had done for the bending lab, uh, and plot those uh, and, and put those values here uh, with what their error is. But you can use the the values you're getting from this plot as a point of comparison. So this should hopefully be correct. I think we checked it once through. Uh, but if you find any errors, let me know. Uh, in the code, you also have the, so it basically calculates stress, the, the radial and the, and the, the radial and the hoop stress and the shear stress, converts that to Cartesian stress and then calculates strain out of it. You can basically do, follow that same process um, when you're calculating the, uh, calculating these points out here. Um, yeah. And so that's, you'll have in the lab a plot of load displacement for the hole, for the plates with and without a hole. You'll then have six contour plots. So we'll be giving you uh, video data for the EX, EY, and EXY uh, strains on the thing. You'll plot that against these theoretical plots for those two applied stresses that, you, that you're using. Um, and then you'll have uh, basically a table of all of these results of all these virtual strain gauges that you'll compare experiment to theory for. Um, we tried to give bulleted discussion points again. Um, so bullet, these are bulleted results points and bulleted discussion points that you should be including in the lab. There's a lot in this one. So we tried to kind of guide you through the process as much as we could. I know there's inevitably going to be some some problems in there. So uh, please start early and feel free to come ask me questions on things. But all right, good luck, have fun.